We are all concerned these days with the development of nuclear energy. We have learned already that it can do a number of nice things and also a very great number of desperately dangerous things. We have no way at the moment, apparently, of applying some form of universal ethics uh, to research in this field. And we do not know whether or not the energy resulting from nuclear fission has any built-in protections. Probably the major built-in protection was that it did very little damage to us until we discovered how to release this energy by a more or less equal division of a heavy atom. From that time on, we have been in trouble. The energy released has been inconceivable. And the thing that more or less amazes us without very much comfort or consolation is that this energy is everywhere in space. The so-called matter that we have been accustomed to think of as more or less a dead substance is actually completely alive, far more alive than perhaps the more visible indications of vitality that we are familiar with. We suddenly live in a world, universe, cosmos of energy. And uh, working with this presents a great many challenges. And this morning, I thought we might try to just kind of ramble along and uh, consider some of the elements and factors involved by means of common examples. Now, this problem of energy seems to tell us one thing primarily, that energy, life, is an internal factor in living things. It is not conferred. It is innate. It is part of the structure of these things themselves, and all living forms live off of their own internal energies. These energies are usually uh, moderately distributed. They come as are needed. There is energy behind the blade of grass, but this blade of grass does not directly lead to any tragedy. It has been directed by inward laws in the use of its energy factor. Everything is using energy in some form, whether it be for personal life or collective social existence. Energy is the great mover of things, both qualitative and quantitative. And uh, we must sometime face the challenge of what to do with it how to use it, how to prevent it becoming a means of complete destruction for everything we value in life. Now, if we are confronted with a problem such as nuclear fission, we are also problemed with a tremendous need for self-discipline. The individual must recognize that with every opportunity to improve living conditions, he must face the responsibilities inherent in those opportunities. He must realize beyond doubt that the more power he has, the wiser and more virtuous he must become. As long as selfishness, arrogance, violence is associated or are associated with nuclear fission, we are going to be in desperate danger. In other words, we have now made a discovery that can be only handled if we grow up as living things and become responsible, intelligent, constructive, and conscientious in the use of the resources that we have developed. Otherwise, these resources are going to turn on us with frightful consequences. It's probable that, therefore, that the development of the nuclear energy field is not only most closely involved in our ethics, but without proper internal maturity, we are going to be in very dangerous situations. 
Now, this brings the other side of the coin into focus, uh, something to do with internal disciplines. And uh, here we think in terms of Zen for a moment. Zen is an extraordinary Eastern philosophy. It is built primarily upon Buddhism. It is also, however, deeply involved in the cosmological and anthropological philosophies of the ancients. Zen is a method of controlling atomic energy inside of ourselves. We are constantly calling upon nuclear fission for existence, but it is done in a very slow, gentle, and non-belligerent way. We release energy according to the disciplines which are imposed upon physical structure. If we release energy too rapidly, we are desperately ill. If we do not re release it rapidly enough, we are languid and inadequate. Also, however, we realize that energy is constantly operating in our conduct. For one thing, for example, if we overdo or overtax and use more energy than we are able to supply or provide, we are not well. If we waste energy, we are also sick. So Zen has been set up as a discipline of character. We have never previously associated it with nuclear fission. But there is something about it that reminds us of the tremendous energy factor not only behind matter, but behind consciousness and intelligence. There is a mysterious illumination process which is more or less similar to the fission of an atom. There is a tremendous power of spiritual energy locked within the psychic atom of man. This energy he has never learned to use properly or correct correctly, except possibly for a very few great teachers of past ages. The development of man's consciousness resource, like the development of his energy resources, this resource has been exploited, misunderstood, and profaned. Man's consciousness was given to him for a reason. And that reason was not conspiracy. It he was not made to be a thinking creature in order to outwit his neighbor. He was not created with faculties to understand and comprehend and then bind them entirely to the profit system. Man internally is misusing his resources, and this in turn has a direct effect upon his health. Now, if we take the individual and kind of look him over, in terms not only of philosophy but of science for that matter, we discover that each person is a cosmos in himself. There are probably as many living entities within each human body as there are creatures living upon the earth. Billions of minute living things cooperate to make the common function of man possible. These minute things become divided, so to say, into races, nationalities. They are given locations, continents. They are nourished. They have their own system of growth and reproduction. They are also able uh, to cooperate in some strange, or probably psychic way, with all of the needs and problems of the body in which they are involved. Possibly, we do not know, Possibly to these little tiny microscopic entities, uh, man as a composite being might be regarded as a god. Maybe he is the great overbeing that is expected to control wisely and lovingly this vast habitation of creatures which he calls his body. Here he has a tremendous responsibility because he is capable in almost any phase of his existence of forgetting his duties and allowing his body to suffer as a result. If this, is deity, if this deity, which we call human spirit, is a just and proper overlord, it will protect the body. But if it is subject to evil habits, if it becomes involved in narcotics or alcoholism, the body as a whole is under a tyranny. 
a tyranny, a despotism, an anarchy of the ambitions of a person paid for by the destruction of millions of lives which have been given to him to assist in the functions of correct conduct. Now Zen approaches this matter on a very severe but perhaps a very reasonable way. In the first place, it begins by pointing out that all excess endangers integrity. Now, this excess can ex endanger mental integrity, emotional, or physical integrity. Wherever the individual loses control of his own conduct, wherever he breaks or whenever he breaks the natural rules and laws of health, he is a traitor to the vast empire within himself. And this empire has ways of revenging itself. And this usually takes the form of physical debility, disease, and perhaps premature death. So the individual has a responsibility to use the energies which are provided to him from the infinite number of small energy units within his own body. If some of these units run away, we have types of disease which can prove to be fatal. If these different units do not cooperate, we have a whole group of mental, emotional, and physical symptoms which must be met or else the compound will be dissolved. Now, the purpose of Zen is not just to hold the parts together with a kind of mucilage of some kind. The purpose of Zen is to keep the harmony of the body, to protect a good government. The, the Zen factor in our consciousness is what is intended to be the just ruler the wise and careful leader, more or less ordained by divine will. This is the part of ourselves that rules the rest by the divine right. It is the king in us, and we are, its, uh, we are the consequences of its conduct. To begin with, then, Zen may start by recommending the simplification of life, to save the individual from wanton waste. Now, we think of waste very largely as a physical byproduct of activity. We think of waste as something that must be removed from the system or found in some way disposed in the community. But actually, what we are really concerned with is the conservation of the life factors by means of which our length of life is largely determined, and also the quality of that life in its relationship to its environment. The moment the individual ceases to be serene, in that moment he becomes dangerous to himself and others. Now we know that most persons are suffering almost constantly from small naggings, from minor things that happen that distress and annoy them. Zen is a discipline to recover from these uh, unfo unfortunate factors. The purpose of Zen is to, fly, is to smooth out, to make even the way of life. Now, this does not mean to make it monotonous. It does not say that we cannot have constructive emotions or mental activities. But it means that negative, destructive releases of energy are dangerous. It is just as dangerous for the individual to have a temper fit in terms of his relationship with the lives within himself as it is to have some foreign nation release an atomic bomb. Anything which destroys balance, which destroys life or misuses it so that it becomes self-destructive, is working a very great hardship not only on his own body and his own life, but upon the community and the world in which he lives. Therefore, it becomes very important for the person to realize that wisdom, in a sense, is a way of life. It is not a mental activity alone. It is the power to discipline conduct by intelligence. Now, this is something we all need. But in order to attain this, it is sometimes necessary to secure special training in such a process. We know that our educational system does not teach us self-discipline. It simply creates habits. 
It causes us to descend or hide ourselves behind a single attitude and remain behind it as an economic factor as long as we live. Actually, however, uh, the consciousness within ourselves is in demand in, in a constant leadership. We have to learn how to rule ourselves. And the man who rules himself is greater than the one that taketh the city, according to the scriptures. Zen, however, is not one of these punishing things. Of course, the Zen monk, under discipline, is provided with intensive opportunities for self-discipline. If he doesn't accept them, he probably will be rejected from the order. But the primary purpose for the layman, the individual who is not actually a member of the Zen community, is to take those parts of the doctrine most useful to himself and apply them to his own immediate needs. The first thing he must do is place a watchfulness upon himself. He must become increasingly aware of his own conduct. It is not that he should become bound to constant personal criticism or analysis, but that he must, in a reasonably relaxed state, observe what he does, how he does it, why he does it, and the consequences. Now, this type of thinking is not very common these days. We live by impulse, which is a law, an explosion or loss of energy. We live with regrets, more energy wasted. We become angry, that is practically nuclear fission. In all these different things, we are constantly misusing the most important thing we own or possess, and that is energy. That is the life within us, which will unfold and evolve with us through all eternity. It is, that, it is the reason that we are alive. We are a mysterious center of energy surrounded by manifestations of itself. These manifestations go into every function of our structure and body. These manifestations include bones, nerves, muscles, glands, and all the different divisions of our uh, physical structure. This energy division also includes our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, our doctrines, our hopes, our fears, our worries, our agitations, our happiness, and our misery. All of these represent expenditures of energy. And we are told now, and probably it is true, that the world at this time is short in energy. This shortness of energy, the supply is not adequate. This shortness of energy is present in each of us. People are not as happy as they used to be. They are not as reliant. They are not as thoughtful. They are not as dedicated to principles. The average person today is wandering around, mostly wasting energy. One of the fine ways of wasting it today is to devote it to television programs. If you watch those long enough, you can suffer from complete exhaustion. And don't forget the energy necessary to produce those programs. Calling upon resources in short supply, we use what there is wastefully. We make no effort to, to try to find a legitimate value in what we do. Most of our time, we are perhaps wasting energy by being sorry for ourselves. Another type of waste is to constantly worry about the world. We do all kinds of things in which we use up energy, fully aware of the fact that the use is going to be non-productive. We can get annoyed at anyone we wish to be annoyed with, but in the end, we have simply wasted more energy. Revenge is a total loss. Anxiety, not much better. All of these different ways in which we waste or use or expend energy have a tremendous effect upon ourselves. In the human being, almost all energy waste is also involved in destruction of tissue and fabric. Wasted energy is depleting the resources of the body to recuperate from disease or to continue the process of growth and repair necessary to its survival. The moment we waste energy, we endanger the one commodity upon which we depend for everything. Therefore, in Zen, we are taught, as best as we can be taught, to conserve energy, to prevent ourselves from any willful waste 
to prevent ourselves from any extraordinary attitude which is going to bring a negative reaction. The moment we overuse energy, we get a reaction. We find a deficit taking the place of the exhaustion. We find ourselves more tired, uh, less able to carry on the constructive works of life, less patient, and gradually less fun uh, functional in our daily habits. Therefore, every waste is resulting in a deprivation. We are some way being penalized for the, muse, for the misuse of the powers at our disposal. Then now it comes into the matter as a philosophy of life. It is based upon a series of attitudes. Zen does not take the Pollyanna, Pollyanna attitude that everything is wonderful. It takes a very simple attitude. Everything is as it is. Everything is real, and reality has a reason. In fact, reality is the prime which we are all working with. When we keep peace and keep faith with reality, we have very few problems. But when we break faith with reality, we begin the disintegration of our entire compound. We will never be as good again as we were before we exhausted our energy resources. To try to meet this exhaustion, we take all kinds of pills, vitamins, etc. We go to nutritionists to find ways of building up energy. But the first and important factor in building up energy is to keep the energy that we already have to use it usefully and constructively. If we are very deeply involved in a worthy cause, and we find that we are not able to carry on as well as we used to, there might be a cause for energy supply in terms of nutrition, in terms of uh, better habits of living. We can take the necessary vitamins and minerals to build up energy that is lost through legitimate activity. If, however, we are wasting all we have, get more pills so we can waste those also, we are not gaining much. We will never really gain until nature and nature's ways are honored, are given precedence over every attitude of our own life. In religion, we get letters quite frequently from people who are confused or disturbed by religious associations of one kind or another. They say that so many people who claim religion and really believe in it never practice it. They are actually constantly speaking about brotherhood, but they do not create brotherhood in their environment. They are told that they be merciful, but they are still critical. We are told to love the strangers, so we can't even love our families. Most people keep all the virtues for themselves alone. Uh, that they love, they love themselves. This, however, is a very little social value. It's much better, therefore, to realize the importance of a doctrine that is not valuable because of its name or because of any of the exercises associated with it. The value lies in the individual taking the disciplines necessary to reform his own nature and qualify himself for a better level of energy and a better destiny in this world and the worlds to come. So as we watch this tremendous demand on energy, more electricity than ever before, and we find all the natural resources of society gradually diminishing, we have a very sad thought somewhere in the back of our minds. What is going to happen when the coal is all gone? What is going to happen when we run out of petroleum? What are we going to do when the various resources of energy which we now have are not only overtaxed beyond the possibility of meeting the demands, or that even the amounts that we have now will gradually fade away? How are we going to get along, for instance, when we have no way of maintaining this intricate cult culture that we have built upon a tremendous internetwork of energies? Well, some of the scientific people are hoping that, that by that time we will be able to tune in on nuclear energy, that the, uh, the only source left to us is the source of universal life itself. Here, however, we have as yet come a very short distance. 
but we have already learned that we are now fooling with something that is extremely dangerous. We want the energy. We are dying to keep up all of these things that we have. But if we keep them up the way we are going now, we are going to die from the consequence of keeping them up. We are going to be in very desperate situation because we are not going to be able to handle a higher degree of energy unless we raise our own level of integrities. We are no longer dealing with materials that we can buy and sell. We are dealing with a universal power that extends beyond space and time, that runs and works according to laws inherent in itself, and there will never be a way in which the human being can alter those laws. He must gradually learn to abide by them and reconcile his own conduct to the requirements of infinite energy. This is going to be quite a little job for him. So he must begin to prepare for it. There is a tendency now for fear to come in and make us a little more cautious. We are discovering a little more every day the danger of our own mistakes. We are realizing that we cannot go on being foolish, even vicious, without ultimately getting into difficulties. Somewhere in the ancient background of things, commandments were given to us by sages or saints, or some believe by the finger of God upon the crest of Sinai. We were given ways of life, commandments, commandments. We were given lessons, morals, fables, parables, to help us to find out what the divine plan for man really means. Now, many may say that there is no proof that these are divine revelations. Now, maybe there is not any actual proof, but there is another kind of proof, and that is the disaster that occurs when we break them. It is not necessary for us to find out who made them. The only thing that is necessary to find out is how we can keep them, and by so doing, to protect ourselves over the long range of the future. It might be interesting to realize that the possible source of energy that we have neglected is the energy resource within ourselves. There is probably enough energy in each human being, if improperly used, to blow the planet out of its orbit. But there is also enough energy in the human being to make it possible for him to gradually and methodically take over the complete direction of his own existence. He can meet all the needs that can arise because these needs are satisfied by resources within himself. And when these emergencies arise, which he must face, the resources come forth to meet them. But the resources can't do anything unless the individual takes a kind of voluntary pledge to keep the rules. We are now greatly burdened by man-made rules, by laws, most of which are inadequate. We are burdened by a complex structure of legislations, of uh, values, of standards, of ethical confusions, which we do not really know what to do about. There is no solution in trying to keep all of these rules without knowing why they're there or what they're about. We can be law-abiding forever and still die young. There's more to it than this. And the thing that is more to it is the realization that all these laws are related to the rules governing our own lives, that we must begin to think in terms of keeping faith with realities. We can no longer live in a kind of fool's paradise. We can no longer say we are each of us entitled to complete independence. We must no longer think in terms of how much liberty we can gain or how, many, how much authority we can destroy. The problem is to realize that we must transfer our allegiance from the insubstantial substance of physical policy and restore it to where it belongs, the infinite rule of a divine plan working in nature. If we can keep the rules of the divine plan, the rest will take care of itself. If we break these rules, no amount of legislation can give us survival. We will perish because we break the rules of life. And this, these rules of life are the guides by which energy, life energy, is directed, controlled, and released 
gradually and properly in the unfoldment and evolution of living things. So we can try for the one thing that the Bible has told us, namely to be still and know. This is Zen. This Zen is to be still and allow the rules to work, to keep out of the way of our own best good, as we uh, term it today. We must gradually come to the condition and point where we permit natural laws to, to work their own ways. Now, this does not mean a blind acceptance of hunches or um, mysterious motions or feelings within ourselves. We need to be disciplined. We need to know what we are doing. But we must prepare ourselves to obey rules that we are now completely ignoring. One way is to help this out would be to get a better educational knowledge of the abilities and liabilities of human life. We should know more about the human being, what he can do and what he can't do. We should understand better the structure of his body and its relation to his consciousness, his mind, his soul and his spirit. We need to find out what constitutes a true normalcy. A normalcy in the face of heaven, and not normalcy among the abnormalcies of human beings. If we can find out the basic pattern of what is best for us, we can then begin to build. Now, many people feel that they have tried to live according to what was best for themselves. But then again, if the level of interpretation was not high enough, if the best was not good enough to provide survival, then the best is not worthy of very much attention. The best must be that which is closest to reality, not that which is closest to self-satisfaction. We must become more and more aware that that which is best for all is also best for us, and that we are no longer simply separate entities struggling for survival like a number of bugs in a water barrel. We are more than this. We are creatures living together bearing witness to millions of years of growth and development. Creatures so incredible that no scientist has ever been able to truly understand that, the structure of the human body. So remarkable in its mentations that the processes of the mind remain un, uh, uh, unsolved mysteries. And also with bodies so extraordinary that no machine ever created by the human being can approach them. Bodies that depend upon miracles performed every day for survival. Bodies that are moved by energies which we have not been able to really discover and which will serve us well if we keep faith with them. All of this is part of a contemplative life. And a contemplative life begins by smoothing out everything that might cause waste that anything that is lost through excess of attitudes. Therefore, it is not wise for the individual to physically over-exercise because he is using too much energy. Socrates was approached on this problem once and he said he would never walk or take a walk unless he was going somewhere. The idea of going around the block 50 times never occurred to the old Greek. And yet he was strong enough so that when he was in battle, the enemy separated and went on each side of him. They didn't face him. So, uh, the physically moderate and right. Rhythmic, not excessive. Every part of physical motion should be more or less dominated by artistry. The human body is a magnificent thing. And it is particularly wonderful to the artist who knows how to use it. The body is something that requires a tremendous amount of, of aesthetic understanding and, and the most delightful and possible protections of all of the functions and properties of the body. So if the body is not overtaxed, it will in an emergency rise to almost any occasion. A body that has been properly taken care of then becomes a strong help in time of trouble. Whereas a body that has been worn out with nuisance values is a very little use to the individual who owns it or anyone else. Then we go into the emotional life of individuals. Emotional energy is more subtle than physical, but it is of the same quality. There is a mysterious 
uh, nuclear fission of the emotional atom. It is subject, the same as the physical, to a tremendous amount of research to understand its way of function, what it really is, how much it can do, and where its boundaries are. All possible means should be used to make sure that the emotional energy does not come into conflict with the physical. If the emotional comes in, there is a tyranny because the physical cannot cope with the emotional. That is always at a disadvantage which is lower, and the physical is lower in its processes than the emotional. So the emotion is a guardian of, the, of physical health. And when it ceases to be a guardian and simply uses the body to satisfy or gratify its emotional propensities, it is then a dictator, a militarist, an anarchist, tearing down uh, the union of the parts which make up the human personality. So we take the emotional nature and find that there are two general kinds of emotions, those that enrich and those that impoverish. Everything that is unpleasant, negative, uh, unfair, unreasonable, selfish, self-centered, over-ambitious, and so forth, all these things are misuses of emotional energy. Whereas love of beauty, kindness, friendship, affection, cooperation, these are emotional virtues. And these virtues protect the physical body because the superior has the power to improve that which is inferior. But the inferior cannot rebel effectively against the superior. So we have in the emotional level what uh, would be called in a meditative discipline the need for the gradual relaxation of stress. Now that you can fight an emotional stress you can fight it by more emotional stress. You can use all kinds of disciplines to uh, whip it into action as though it were an animal trainer. But at the same time, none of these things will work effectively because they simply create more energy extravagance. The simple answer is if you just quiet down, you don't need any other remedy. If you just simply relax away from pressure, uh, not in any sense of the word neglecting a proper duty, not giving up Im important emotional in uh, commitments, but simply wasting no emotion on negative attitudes. All negative attitudes have destructive effect upon the physical body, and the emotional attitudes of millions of people have also a tremendously detrimental effect upon the emotional nature of the planet. They create the wars, revolutions, despotisms, and anarchies. They turn people against each other. They justify war, rebellion, and catastrophe. These are all more or less dependent upon lack of emotional integrity. So that we can look around us and see how important it is that we really try to keep the emotional nature under some type of reasonable control. Once we begin to control it, we find it's rather nice. We find that it is much nicer to be happy than miserable, and that we have less to burden us if we forgive than if we continue to nurse grudges. If we keep our minds off of ourselves and no longer suffer from self-pity, uh, we have a new contentment rising in our own natures. And all of these processes together make physical life more stable. They give us greater securities. They give us more friends that can be useful and helpful. They make us more charitable and also more welcome in the lives of those around us. Emotional attitudes, therefore, should be watched. And the next time irritation rises up, drop into the Zen attitude. Be very quiet. And allow some uh, relaxation to move in on you. Instead of building it up and adding by imagination to the fault that is already overabundant keep quiet, or very gently try to understand the good behind the situation. If somebody annoys you, uh, be quiet for a moment and realize that this is an opportunity not to be annoyed. And that when you are able to make most of that opportunity, you have had a marvelous lesson in self-discipline. 
So wherever anything happens that would in almost certainly cause you to be excited or displeased, realize that this is a test, a kind of an initiation, and that if you are able to pass this test, you have stepped forward in the real development of your own humanity. So we have the emotions by means of which the body can be protected or persecuted. And then we proceed on to the mind, and here we really have a tricky fellow. The mind is a, a center of self-justification. The mind is for all, forever telling us that we're right, whether we are or not. And the mind is also forever telling us that we're entitled to anything that we want, and this is also untrue. The mind tells us that we are living in a fun generation, but the mind is a liar because very few people are having any fun. <laughs> we are told that we should have anything we want, but all we get, get out of this is an exaggeration of our desires. We want more. The more we get, the more we want, and when it comes to the final end of things, we leave it all behind. The mind has become a servant of our pleasures. It has found ways to contrive the justification of almost anything that we want. The mind tells us whatever we think we need, we need. And it also helps us constantly uh, to build false pictures of our environments and our relationships with other people. The mind, therefore, is lazy. Very few minds really want to think. What they really want to do is to scheme. They want to jump at some conclusion. They want to back up an emotional attitude. They want to say to you or to themselves that the emotions say, I must have it. The mind says, well, then you probably better get it. And the result is emotion plus mind equals bankruptcy. <laughs> all, the, all these things we have to take into consideration, yet the mind is not so bad. The mind also is an atom that can be split. It has tremendous energy potentials. In fact, we are wasting mental energy even more rapidly than any other kind. Because wherever we use a faculty or a function without training it, without giving it proper boundaries, without understanding what we're doing, we're working a hardship upon that faculty itself. So the mind today is behind our politics, behind our international intrigues, behind all these various um, colossal projects of mankind, which really mean nothing. The mind gives us a world which is little better than a castle in a sandbox. The mind as we use it today would have been appropriate to the requirements of the average eight-year-old child, but it's not equivalent to the needs of the moment. So the mind has to be given the time to cool off, quiet down, and uh, be released also from the pressures of emotions or the constant nervous tensions of the body. The mind is a, a kind of a gentle creature, a teacher. It is the old sage, but it is also one of those conservative creatures that tries to justify anything we want. It is constantly catering to often the worst part of ourselves. Another thing that the mind can do is to substitute involved thinking for knowledge, which is not the same, they're not the same thing. The mind, for instance, has given a science, and science is a branch of learning that tells us everything except what we want to know. And here it falls down. And if we become really learned in science, uh, we become a professor, uh, we write textbooks on the subject, and uh, we gain a good reputation. But when it's all said and done, we are almost in the same place that we before were before. The values, the great lessons, the mysteries of existence, which are the primary subject of human need, are not there. Therefore, the individual comes locked within a little intellectual universe made largely of his own thinking and intended largely for the gratification of his own instincts and attitudes. On one occasion, Mrs. Einstein visited one of the large observatories and looked at the magnificent telescope 
And she asked them what it had been built for. And the attendant that was there said, it was built in order that we might measure the boundaries of the universe. And Mrs. Einstein smiled and said, well, you know my husband did that on the back of an envelope. <laughs> and to, to a certain degree, this is about the way it is. We are working with a tremendous mental world, and we're getting so fascinated by it that we think it is going to do us some good. But if it hasn't done it by now, it is not likely to do it in the near future. We are simply caught in a mental pattern. We justify our thoughts without understanding them. And we also continue to think of them and with them, although we have not considered the universe in which we live. It is assumed that the universe is whatever we want it to be. And if it isn't, it will be if we plan long enough and hard enough. But with the length and hardness of our planning, we come only to extinction. We cannot escape from the inevitables of the universal procedure. And every person with a philosophy of life has finally got to base it on universal truths. Nothing else will serve the purpose. Nothing else can uh, help us to the degree that we need help. Then above the mind, we have certain other faculties which are a little dim, but which we do mean, we do think a great deal of. One of them is the soul. And probably the soul is the most powerful atom that we know. It is said on some occasions, or believed, that the illumination of Buddha, when the universe opened, and all the deities of all the worlds flowed down to form a vast galaxy of radiance that extended from one end of space to the other, that this was the fission of a soul atom. In other words, illumination is this transcendence, the complete release of energy. And this energy, as spiritual or soul power, has a very large part to play in our lives, much more than we realize. We are not supposed to be sitting around waiting for this soul atom to, to be split, but we do have to recognize that the soul is an energy, and that this energy has a tendency uh, to attempt to control the conduct of the individual to whom that particular soul is attached. The soul, therefore, is a moral force. It is conscience, perhaps, if you want to call it that. It is certainly a mysterious guardian angel. It is a power. The Greeks and Egyptians called it the daemon. Not demon, but daemon. A spirit, an invisible thing, more powerful than any uh, power that we know in this world. This soul power is the thing that reverses the motion of energy in our bodies. While we are functioning in the normal way, the soul is generally locked away by itself with every effort being made to prevent any of its impulses from reaching our daily conduct. We do not want to be led by the soul today. We know that it will interfere with wealth, worldly position, and all the things that we regard as important. It may also warn us against alcohol and narcotics, or any other evil habit. But because of our attitudes, we do not want the soul to take the leadership. We want the soul to be very quiet, to contribute nothing if possible, and remain uh, inactive throughout life. Occasionally, however, we get a little twinge of need near the end and try to make some peace with this mysterious overpower in ourselves. But the soul as an energy can be of the greatest value, but it must function very quietly. If we put the mind to rest, not negative, but just calm, and let the emotions rest in peace, and let the physical body relax normally, and everything is quiet and peaceful, we may have the opportunity to hear or sense the presence of the soul or what Emerson calls the over-self. Then we begin to get messages from the inside. Now, we get messages from the inside on other levels. I know people have gotten some horrible messages from the inside. Uh, we can be deceived and deceive others on the grounds that it came from inside ourselves. But the real fact of the matter was it was merely a sublimation of wrong mental thinking, wrong emotional pressures, and wrong physical conditions. The negative mind 
the uh, self-centered emotions can also radiate messages, but they are all tinctured by self-interest. They are all the result of, of egotism or ambition or worldly pressures. But if we are quiet and these pressures are not active, then the natural power of the soul as, and its energies can come forward to become a vitalizing force in our daily life. If the soul is able to lead the rest, the individual is practically safe. He will then grow as he was intended to grow with the superior controlling the inferior on every level. The body must be controlled by the energy fields. The energy fields must be controlled by the emotions. The emotions must be controlled by the mind. And in due course, the mind must be controlled by the soul. When the superior in each case leads the rest, we have the proper government. We have a true commonwealth. We have no longer a despotism. We have the proper regard so that each part of our compound nature is duly and properly protected and given the resources necessary for its proper function. Now the soul power gives us a capacity for peace. The soul gives us that something which surpasseth understanding. It is that which in I mean, everything makes the individual indestructible. It is something that cannot be taken away by any actual circumstance of physical existence. All motions, all thoughts, all physical conditions are relaxed into a normalcy in which the individual is not frustrated, not inhibited in any way, but is completely relaxed to reality. If he can gain this attitude, he will then have the energy fields of his body uh, in the best possible relationship. Mesmer and several of those who worked uh, with magnetism were quite convinced of the reality of a magnetic factor in the human being. This magnetic factor uh, worked upon an energy field which was natural to the person. Every individual living thing, from even a tiny little pebble, up to the vast galaxy itself. Everything has an energy field. This energy field bears witness to the radiance of the gradual release of atomic energy. This energy field is the atom in ourselves acting as a motive power for all else. This was probably the idea behind the legend of the Atlantean energy called Vril. Uh, Vril was an energy which was internally created, depended on no fuel, depended on no machine. But without fuel, it could move and, and activate anything. It could, it could create motion, but it was never, in a sense, uh, supplied by any power outside of itself. Maybe something in the field of perpetual motion could come under the same heading. But anyway, this emotional or vital field of energy, which Mesmer referred to, uh, he said very simply that as long as this radiant field of energy was protected, the individual would have good health. All sickness was an obstruction to the flow of life force. For the moment there was interference with the proper distribution of energy, sickness began. And if this force was deflected long enough, the area that was deprived would die. And as a result of the death of a small area, the rest of the body would be infected and not ultimately perish also. So that this energy field was something that had to be protected. And all sickness was interruption in the flow of energy. Now also in our larger life, our unhappiness is an interruption in the flow of life energy. Thoughtlessness causes it sometimes. Stubbornness, anything that is a frustrating force, inhibits energy. Opinionism, set to the point that the individual is unable to escape from his own fixed attitudes. This in itself is an, an obstruction to energy, and the opinionated person will ultimately perish from his own opinions. Everywhere, 
obstruction of any kind is the cause of tragedy. So the individual uh, must prepare two things. He may have to prepare to live in an age in which uh, nuclear fission becomes a major factor in his life. He may be under those conditions afflicted by the dangers of this uh, form of energy. He must also, however, having this problem on his hands and living perhaps always in the shadow of a possible catastrophe, he must work on himself. He must fit himself to enter into an age of uncertainties and yet at the same time be completely certain of his own inner life. He must be able to carry on without fear or anxiety even though conditions become increasingly perilous. His greatest protection is this, inability, this ability uh, to control his own hysterias, his own emotions, and his own fears. <clears throat> There's an interesting legend of an ancient city of the East in which a wise man went forth from the city to talk with the spirit of the plague. And the spirit of the plague was a great, powerful being, but in this particular case, basically a person of integrity, because plagues are not uh, the result of some evil force on the outside. Plagues come from the people who suffer from them. But in any event, in this particular case, the wise man asked the plague to do a great favor. He said, when you go through this city, don't take everyone. Take only one out of a hundred. Therefore, maybe take a hundred altogether out of the city and spare the rest. And the plague said, that seems to me to be a very reasonable request. And by Allah, I will do it. I will take only one in a hundred. And the others shall live. So the plague went through the city and everyone died. And the wise man went out afterwards and said, why did you break your word? Peg said, I didn't. I only took one in a hundred. The other ninety-nine in every hundred died of fright. <laughs> now, this is a, 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 an old story, but it has certain advantages. In a di time of anxieties, let us be careful not to die of the anxieties and instead of realizing that there are many ways we can survive unfortunate or unpleasant con inconveniences. The problem we have always is that if the inner life is serene, we have a greater possibility of achieving the securities that we need. I knew a nurse at one time who worked for a number of years in a leper colony and uh, never had the mailman. And so I said to her after she had retired and gone home, I said, uh, how do you feel, what do you feel was the reason why you never had the ailment? She's always very simple. I let it be known to God that I was doing the best job I could for him. And that whatever he wanted, I will have it. If he wants me to have leprosy, I'll get it. If he doesn't want me to, I won't get it. But regardless of anything, I will serve him. And with this attitude, she didn't get it. Whereas others, around in the same colony, did get it. And the tremendous integrity behind the dedication is important. And in the time of uh, these nuclear researches, there is something to be said for the power of the individual to survive by the very real intensity of his own inner life. A life that simply does not take on the overtones of anxiety, which are more likely to kill than anything else. In the Great Plague of London in the 17th century, uh, death was on every street. There was not really an, any way of burying the dead. And one individual who had the plague became so hysterical and so overcome with fear that he rushed screaming through the state, uh, streets of London and jumped into the Thames. When he hit the water, he got well. The guy came out, 
and recovered. And they asked him why it happened. Well, he said, I really don't know, but I think it's because I became more afraid of drowning than I was of the plague. <laughs> so many times, problems of all levels, mental, emotional, physical, are more or less basically imaginary, are dramatized by our own reactions, and we die of these dramatizations. There are a great many cases where miraculous things have happened as a result of the tremendous intensification of a constructive attitude. I think this has probably been true of most of the shrines of healing as Lourdes uh, in France. Everyone isn't healed, but certain persons who have a tremendous faith in things, a faith greater than fear, reminds us what of the story of the, of the plague. It is fear that becomes the most deadly and desperate emotion in life. It not only affects our physical health, but affects our relationships with society. It affects our voting at the polls. It affects our jobs. It has a very definite destructive effect upon family life. It destroys relationships between parents and children. Everywhere, from the banking system up and down, fear leads to panic, and panic leads to destruction. So that inside of ourselves, when calamities or misfortunes begin to worry us, we must recognize the importance of not fearing. Now, in ancient times, and to a great degree still among many people, faith becomes the antidote for fear. The individual has some internal conviction about a power superior to himself. He becomes aware that he has a belief, a faith, that perhaps represents the soul dimension within himself. However it is figured, it is a power to trust realities. And when faith takes the place of fear, miracles happen. Miracles of healing happen. Miracles of adjustment to society. Everywhere, faith becomes a power even in the problem of nuclear fission because faith is another very important energy. The ancients realized for some reason that we've never been able to fully understand uh, that all these feelings, emotions, emotions, attitudes, beliefs, and convictions are beings, not merely thoughts in the mind. Therefore, they created deities out of all their emotions and attitudes. And these deities became uh, more or less independent beings that were capable of being requested or invoked for help. And uh, by this means, all these positive, constructive factors became gods or goddesses, and all the destructive attitudes became demons. And wherever destructive attitudes took over, plagues followed of one kind or another. But where constructive attitudes dominated, things cleared up, and uh, the credit was given to the deity. But the deity, of course, was really part of the soul atom. It was part of the tremendous power in the soul to become the redeemer, because the soul atom, or energy, being the highest, was able to control the rest if it was properly used. If it was properly understood, properly uh, recognized, and the individual called upon it in his hour of trouble. Therefore, religion becomes, again, another great nuclear entity. It becomes a tremendous vital force. And uh, in our case, the splitting of the religious atom has caused the same kind of tragedy that we fear from the physical atom. The moment religion was broken up into a mass of creeds, its constructive value was largely decimated. And for a long time, this destructiveness was not especially noticeable because religions were local. They belonged to races and nations and cities. But when the world power began to develop and, and religions began to be part of a great world picture, the conflicts between them became very dangerous to the survival of the human being. 
if we split the religious atom, so to say, and be recognize or believe that religion is a mass of different realities, we are in trouble, for there is only one reality. And the reality in this case, the tremendous energy of the union of religious parts into one, one tremendous totality, we call God. This is the infinite energy that rules and governs all things. If we break it up and say, my God and your God, we are in difficulties. Wherever we break up, we are in trouble. What we must try to do is to go up to the totality of it. We must try in one way or another to put together the parts of ourselves. We cannot say this is the right leg and this is the left. We have to recognize that they are equally important and are both part of one body. All division is within bodies, but the, the body as a principle is never divided. All religions exist within one religion, and that one religion is never divided. All of the divisions, all of the separations, all of the conflicts and confusions uh, are due to that little thing we call the mind, that this atom has taken over. So in Zen, we go back again to this same point, that by being calm and quiet, by being dedicated, we gradually discipline ourselves away from the causes of our troubles. In Zen, for example, we escape the pressure of worldliness. We are not any longer ambitious for public office. We are not ambitious for wealth. We are not ambitious for recognitions. We are not self-centered or vain. We live, in, in a sense, as naturally as possible, and all the energies that we have are devoted to services and good works. We try to use the power we have as it should be for the greater good of the greater number. The life in us is dedicated to the needs of others because all we can do for them also is to help them to release the life that is within themselves. So the great, el the great atom is in all of us, a most tremendous and wonderful experience it comes through the gradual recognition of the tremendous integrity that is locked within each of us. It is behind the criminal, it is behind the person who is today without morality. It is behind the rich and the poor, the great and the humble. And in all cases, it is this tremendous blazing star or spark which is life, which brings us into a partnership with all that lives, for regardless of our race or our estate, the spark in us is the same. In some cases, the energy of this spark has been more developed than in others. Some have given greater areas for its manifestation. Some have, for instance, taken on learning in order that that flame in us might shine brightly in some branch of human society. But whatever we do, whether we settle down to being a good carpenter, or whether we try to become a priest or become an educator. Only thing we are really doing is releasing a part of this energy atom in ourselves. We are releasing it into manifestation. We are empowering a virtue. Now, we might have been very willing and desirous of empowering it before, but we had not trained the instrument for its manifestation. Whatever we want to do to release this power from within ourselves, we have to have something to offer. In this old story of the tabernacle in the wilderness, uh, the offerings were brought to the altar of the temple or the tabernacle. Each brought a gift offering. Each brought something. And the a most acceptable offering, of course, was the animal nature of the individual himself. There were labors of purification where the individual gradually overcame his own selfishness and all these physical limitations. And at last, purified of all dross, he was permitted to enter into the holy place. But this is, of course, this is exactly the way it is in life. We have to bring our offerings to this energy. The individual says, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Well, that, the idea is good, but the motivations are inadequate. An individual says, I want to do, I want to do good, 
I think people should have better homes. I'll help them build them. So I'll study carpentry. And when we become a good carpenter, then that ray of our inner soul atom vitalizes that ability and uh, we become servants of truth. For always we are serving the atom that is truth and the tremendous energy center, the great spiritual atom which we call the universe, is always dedicated to good. And that which serves good gains universal citizenship. While we are tied up in our own little personal belongings and beliefs and feelings, we are private citizens. But when we begin to serve the larger causes, we are citizens of the world. And uh, with this energy factor developing as it is, we probably will have to become aware every day of the application of certain symbolism to the new forces, new energies, and new resources that we are developing. But with ever, all of it, we have to realize that we are never able to get away from the divine purpose. No matter what we learn, no matter how much we know or how strong we become, all rest finally with the integrities which are established in nature. When we keep the rules, we are, we are wise and good. And as we keep the rules, we discover that doing the things that are necessary are the greatest joy. And all other things become secondary. This is again a way in which we approach the problem of Zen. For in Zen quietude and self-discipline, we have reached that condition in which we permit no attitude to interfere with realities. Now this sounds as though it might be frustrating, but it is not. Because the realities are more beautiful, more wonderful, and more valuable than any false interpretation we can place upon them. It is tremendously important above all things to have inner peace and until the world has inner peace the struggles of humanity will never cease we will never be able to uh, fulfill our proper destiny until the inner life is at rest because it is firmly established in truths that are eternal until we have these firm, firm establishments all of our outer affairs cannot be properly brought into proper relationships so out of all this study of atoms and so forth, we're probably going to develop a new philosophy, a philosophy of the realization that the potential of the human being is infinite, that the unfoldment of life is eternal, that all that is necessary is always available. But between them, that which is available and that which we use is the barrier of our own ignorance. Therefore, we should be spending as much time as we can preparing ourselves for a larger destiny than we have ever known. Not a destiny of honors and wealth and distinctions, but a destiny of inner realizations, the gradual and ultimate realization of our place in the divine plan of things. And we also will gradually come to know as a result of this that there is no easy quietude beyond. We're not going to do very much harp playing. We're not going to float around on flowery beds of ease, as stated in the old hymns. We are going to find that the further we go, the more we will come under the tyranny of infinite power. We will realize that we are constantly required to, to manifest the divine purpose. That wherever we are, we are going to be working to protect the flow of this divine atom in ourselves. That we are going to find more and more ways of using it. We are also going to find that it is our ever-present help in time of trouble. Finally, this mysterious atom in ourselves becomes obviously the real self and contains within itself the, the possibility, the potential of every value existing in nature. That little spark of divine life in us locks within itself a cosmos as vast as any universe we can imagine. There is no end to the unfoldment of life, but all of this unfoldment is toward the final justification of existence 
until someday, in spite of the scientific opinions to the contrary, we are going to find that the universe is a happy place. That it is a place of fulfillments and not of frustrations. And that we are all privileged to grow along with each other toward this goal. And that when we understand this growth, the happiness begins with the understanding. We don't have to wait for the growing. Everything that we believe and want can be fulfilled. There can be nice homes. There can be happy children. There can be busy people doing interesting things. There can be self-expression, developments in arts and ethics. There can be all kinds of wonderful experiences as we go along. The moment we change the point of view and get away from this constant sense of separateness, which is the split atom, and realize actually that these separatenesses all fall together to make one. And that in the fullness of time, the fullness of realities, uh, we can earn anything we want, anything we need. And that actually Zen tells us this. It says you can have anything you want for one very simple reason. You won't want anything. <laughs> And I think with those kind words, we better stop. <laughs>